And please just remain standing for a moment. How many of you have got your smartphone with you? Raise it. Get your smartphone out. Wave your smartphone at me. Come on, hold it high. Be proud of it. Come on, wave. Where is that smartphone? Wave it high. Hallelujah. How we thank God for our smartphone. Praise the Lord. We wouldn't go anywhere without that. Glory to God. Okay, now raise your Bible. Where's your Bible? Come on. Where's your Bible? Ah, oh, some of you are trying to be very smart with me. Raise your Bible. I mean real Bibles. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now keep that Bible raised. Father, we want to thank you for the eternal word of God. Not something that just passes on a whim. Not just something that comes and goes. But words that were written thousands of years ago. Seared in eternity. Branded in our hearts. Living forever. We thank you that Jesus said the word that I speak. They are spirit and they are life. Hallelujah. And we bless you for your word this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. You may be seated. You know, I get this little thing that comes up on my smartphone every week. It says, uh, this is what your screen time was. It's quite shocking, isn't it? You know, if you get that. I won't even tell you how much screen time I have. And then I, I think, you know, we should have a, a, little, a little electronic thing that comes up on our Bible. This is how much page time you've had this week. You know, how much word time you've had this week. Because these are the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Um, what a great message from Carla last week. If you didn't hear that, uh, you need to, to get on to YouTube and watch that message. It's funny over the years how the things that people say. Uh, you know, when one of our young people is coming through. I remember this happened when, when Graham began to preach and we, we were promoting Graham and he, he, he'd come out with a, you know, a big five-star message one week and somebody would come up to me afterwards and nudge me and say, oh, yep, look out, you know, you, you need, you know, um, someone's after your job, you know, and, and well, they're welcome. They're welcome to it. Or, or hey, look out, he's going to knock you off your perch. Great. Go ahead. You see, what we've got to understand is that's what we want. That's the whole point of it. It's not to protect a position for as many years as I can, but to really make our ceiling someone else's floor. Because if we don't, if our ambition is not that we raise up sons and daughters who go further and fly higher than us, if that is not our mandate, then what we're saying is we don't want anyone to go further. That's it. We've set the bar and no one's going further. That, that's, that's terrible. We, you know, I want you to understand the ethos, the DNA of, of this ministry and this church is to develop leaders who go further than us. Sons and daughters who go further. That's our ambition. Because we go from glory to glory. From faith to faith. From increase to increase. We don't have it all. We, our job is, is, is to set up the success of others. Amen? So praise the Lord. No one could be more delighted when somebody succeeds well and and, and does a good job. No one could be happier than me. And Ursula, and Graham, and Becca, and Dave, and others, you know, the mums and the dads in the room. We, we love it. We absolutely love it. That's our core value is family. Amen. Well, uh, so she kicked off with Advent last week, but I'm actually, there's something that God has actually to finish off on the whole matter of devotion. So this morning, I'm going to uh, finish this whole thing of devotion. And I had a message title. Did we, did we get the message title? You know, we don't do message title. Nobody told me. And I emailed the message title. And it was, it was, a, you know, it was a real cracking good title. And, and I, was, I thought it was going to come up. And nobody told me we don't do the message title. So, um, 
I'm going to tell you what the message title is. Don't quit. Your breakthrough is coming. Amen? Don't, I think that would have looked great up there, personally. But there we go. Another time. Um, don't quit. Your breakthrough is coming. I want you to say that after me. Don't quit. Your breakthrough is coming. Now, I, I want you to say, I'm not going to quit. My breakthrough is coming. Turn to one of your neighbors and, and t- say to them, don't quit. Your breakthrough is coming. <clears throat> Amen. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke's gospel, and we're going to look at two parables, right? Two parables, two very similar stories. Two para- parallel parables. How about that? That's a mouthful, isn't it? Two parallel parables. Blah, blah, blah. Two parallel stories. The first one is in Luke chapter 15. Would you turn there, please? Luke chapter 15. And you can get ready and put your finger in Luke 18. And these are really important stories from Jesus. Parables about breakthrough in prayer. So Luke chapter 11 from verse 5. And Jesus said to them, which of you having a friend, and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within the house and say, don't trouble me. The door is shut and my children are in bed. We're all in bed and I cannot rise and give it to you. I'm not going to help you. You're a pest. Go away. It's two in the morning. What are you talking about? But I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, because of his persistence, his perseverance, he will rise and give him as many loaves as he needs. Because he wants to go back to sleep and he doesn't want this guy knocking on his door. Have the bread. Go away. (laughs) Let me get some sleep. So Jesus said, I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Or, correctly, in the the Greek is the present continuous tense. We should read it like this. Ask and keep on asking. And it will be given to you. Seek and keep on seeking and you will find. Knock and keep on knocking and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Amen. Now turn to Luke chapter 18. And while you're turning there, let me tell you about the first parable that we've read. In that one, God is presented as a loving Father to whom we bring our requests. He's, Jesus is saying, look, if, if you, uh, you, you know, if, 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 a, if a friend will do this for another friend, then further down he says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So in this parable, There is a relational connection. Even though he is his friend, he won't get up. But because he persists, he perseveres, he will give him what he needs. How much more? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The basis of coming to God in this parable is the goodness of our heavenly Father. God is your Father. He is a good Father. Now in Luke 18, it's a similar thing, but there's a change here. Let's have a look at this. Luke 18 and verse 1. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's a good thing, isn't it? That's a good bit of medicine, that we should pray and not lose heart. And he said, 
There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. And there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, please vindicate me, give me justice from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, I will vindicate her, I will do justice, lest by her continual coming she wears me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge, now he's a judge, but he doesn't care. In the first parable, we have a caring father. In the second parable, we have a judge with the legal ability. He doesn't care, but he's a judge. But because of persistence, right? Because of persistence, he says, I will vindicate. I'll give her what she needs. And shall God not avenge his elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So in this Second story, God is presented, God is presented as a righteous judge in comparison to the unrighteous judge. So we had a, a friend, an unwilling friend, but God is our Father who is willing. In the second one, we have a, an unrighteous judge, but he has the power and ability to vindicate this lady compared with God who is a righteous judge. And will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and get it quickly. The basis for coming to God in the second parable is that we have a just cause before a righteous God. In the first parable, we are God's children and he is a good father. In the second parable, we have a good cause, and he is a righteous judge. So two aspects of God are presented. God is our loving Father, and God is a righteous judge. And these two parables present prayer being answered on the basis that God is a good, good Father and a just, righteous judge. God is is both. God has the will to answer your prayer and he has the ability to answer your prayer. The goodness of God and the justice of God fit seamlessly together. There was a man that came to Jesus and he said, Lord, if you're willing, he was a leper, he said, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, said, I am willing, be clean. You see, he was moved with compassion. He loved the man, but he had the power to make him clean. It would be terrible, wouldn't it, if God loved us but couldn't help us. It would be equally awful if God could help us but was unwilling to help us. But God is both. He's your loving, heavenly Father. And He is a righteous, just judge. He can and He will. He can and He wants to. He he is able and He is willing. And these are the foundations for devotion. Our heart is devoted to Him. And our heart is knit to him in prayer because we know he's our father and he's a just judge. Hallelujah. When I come to God, I know that I know that I know he's my father. And I know that he settles my case. And this is my confidence before him. My breakthrough is assured. You see, the throne room of God is also the living room of the Father and the courtroom of the judge. When I grew up as a young believer, my first understanding of God was that he is this all-powerful, remote, majestic figure, and heaven is his 
throne room. When I came to know Jesus at the age of 12, I realized that the throne room was also the courtroom. Because God is a judge, and I stood before him as a guilty sinner, and there was no answer apart from Jesus. And Jesus came, and he came with blood-stained hands and feet because he had paid the price for my sin. And he stood in the court of heaven, interceded on my behalf, and God was satisfied. It's not the wrath of God that is satisfied. It's the justice of God. That's, that's the issue. There's a, so much tosh being spilled around social media and people trying to rewrite the gospel, you know, to, to try and make out that, that uh, theologians claim that God killed Jesus and God was angry with Jesus. No, 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 no. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were as one in the plan of redemption. And the Son willingly and lovingly laid down his life for us. God did not, God is not this, as Steve Chalk claims, a cosmic child abuser, a murderer of, of, of his son. The Father and the Son in the councils of heaven came up with the beautiful, incredible plan of redemption that the Son should go and, and representing the Father and lay down his life for us willingly. Hallelujah. And in doing that, the justice of God was satisfied in the courtroom of heaven. But you know what? Then I saw that and I came to know Jesus as my Savior. And then, many years later, I discovered another incredible truth that heaven is not only the throne room where God sits as Lord and King. It's not only the courtroom where He sits as judge. It's the living room where He sits as Father. And in fact, the, the living room is and the fatherhood of God is his true identity. Because when Jesus presented the gospel to us in, in Luke 15, the, the prodigal son, it's the story not, not of, a, of a judge, but of a father who lost his son and wants his son back. And the story of the gospel is the story of a family. <laughs> and, and you and I are, were the lost children. And, and the father comes out of the house, runs to the son, embraces him, puts a cloak around his shoulders, sandals on his feet, a ring on his finger, brings him home, not to judge him, not to send him to the servants' quarters, but he brings him and restores him, kills the fatted calf and celebrates. And what does he say? It's right that we celebrate because this, my son, was dead but is alive, was lost, but is found. Hallelujah. We're God's children and he is our father. So when we come to God in prayer, when we come with our requests, when we come with our burdens, we don't come to a remote, angry, scowling, shadowy figure somewhere up there. We come and we jump up on the lap of our loving Heavenly Father and He hears our heart and He hears our prayers. And He says, hmm, I can do something about that. And as He puts His hands around us, we see there, the hands of the sun with the, with the nail scars in them because the price has been paid for you and I to have all that we need. Hallelujah. Amen? So the blood of Jesus has been presented in the courtroom of heaven before Almighty God to give us the legal right to all the promises of God. So the justice of God enables him to do for us what the love of God wants to do for us. Let me say that last sentence again. The justice of God that was demonstrated in the death of Jesus and the spilling of his blood, the justice of God enables him to do for us what his love wants to do for us. He's a loving father and a just judge. Hallelujah. The characters in these parables persisted because they didn't doubt. 
You see, they, they, they came, the lady came saying, I know this judge is not a very nice character, but he has the power to help me. Therefore, I'm going to persist. I'm going to persist. And in the first parable, the friend comes by night, banging on the door of his friend, and he says, I know he's asleep, but he's my friend. And if I persist, I'll get what I need. And these parables are about perseverance. But not perseverance to twist the arm of an unable or reluctant God, but perseverance on the basis that God is able and God is willing. You see, when we come to God for our breakthrough, you've got to have a foundation. You've got to have a basis. And there's got to be an agreement between earth and heaven. And these parables give us the, the, the foundation for that agreement, the foundation by which we can come and persevere in prayer. You see, there is a place for perseverance. And, and, and God wants to eliminate all doubt from our hearts by showing us that He's our loving Heavenly Father and that He's a just judge. They persevered because they knew. Yeah? They persevered because they knew they would get an answer to prayer. They persevered just as we can persevere, I persevere because I know God is my Father. And I persevere because I know He's just and righteous. That's the reason I persevere and I don't doubt. Now, my friends, let me say something about doubt. I might ruffle some feathers. That's okay. You're, you're right to have some feathers ruffled. <laughs> You cannot come to God with your doubts. We've got to stop turning doubt into some kind of virtue. It's very fashionable these days to kind of, um, you know, big up doubt. Doubts become this big thing. You know, oh, we've got to, you've got to celebrate your doubts. You know, you've got, to, you've got to own your doubts. You've got to occupy your doubts. You've got, to, you've got to explore your doubts. You know, doubt is good. No, doubt is toxic. Doubt is bad. Doubt removes the foundation of confidence. Now, you know, it's okay if you want to explore, you know, modern psychology of doubt. Fine, you go and do that. But if you want answers to prayer, it won't happen that way. The Word of God is very clear. Jesus never endorsed doubt. When Peter was sinking in, 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 you know, walking on water one minute and then beginning to sink, you know, Jesus stretched out his, his hand and said, Why did you doubt? Because doubt will rob you of your confidence. Doubt will, will, will nibble away. It will erode your faith. Let's turn to a couple of scriptures. It's worth doing a little bit of journeying on this. I want you to turn to James chapter 1. I want to show you from the Word of God that it doesn't matter how... Um, you see, the, the, the problem is, if, if, you can, if you can just give in to your doubts, it's, it's, it's kind of um, a little bit of a, a false comfort. It makes you feel easier because it's hard to persevere. It, 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 takes, it takes something about a person to, to exercise belief in God. Doubt is easy, but terribly destructive. And I want, I want to show you this. James chapter 1, verse, um, verse 6. But let him ask in faith, without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The Bible doesn't pull any punches about the toxic uh, nature of doubt. The word double-minded, you see, we think that doubt... And let, me, let me explain what doubt is. Doubt is not... Uh, a, a lack of believing, doubt is an internal argument. The word double-minded there means, it, it's diacrino, it means to have two voices. 
double-minded. It means there's an argument going on because doubt always has to have another rationale to weaken your faith. You see, with Peter, he, he's believing and his faith is based on the word of Je uh, Jesus. Jesus had come to me. Peter said, if, 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 you're the, if that's really you, Lord, bid me come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. What held Peter up on the water? It was not his faith. It was, his, it was the word of Jesus. It wasn't that he kept, oh, I, I can do this. If I just believe hard enough, I can do it. No. His, the foundation for Peter's faith was that Jesus told him to come. So he said, I'm, I'm only doing what he told me to do. So he was walking quite happily and confidently on the water on the basis of Jesus' word, come. But then an argument entered in his mind based on his senses of what's going on. And so a voice said, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. People don't do this. Look at these waves. In fact, Matthew 14 says, you know, when he saw the waves and the wind, he began to doubt. Why? Because the waves and the wind were telling him a different message to the word of Jesus. And so there was an argument in his mind. Doubt is when you listen to the other side of the argument. Doubt is always based on another rationale. And we have to constantly feed and fill our hearts with the Word of God because it's the Word of God that's the basis for strong faith when we come to God in prayer for whatever it is we need, whatever it is we're asking. It's based on the Word of God. So, um, amen. Just turn to one more. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Um, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Let's flip that over. Faith pleases God. Faith pleases God. If you want to have the pleasure of God in your life, then exercise faith. Make the choice. Now, it's not that I'm condemning anyone for having doubts because I've had doubts in my life. But the point is this. When there is a doubt, you have to choose which voice you're going to listen to, which voice you want to believe. So don't make doubt your camping place. If you pass through a valley of doubt, just keep walking. Just don't pitch your tent there. Amen? Don't pitch your tent in the valley of doubt because it will erode your faith. And two weeks or two months or two years down the road, you'll look around and you, there'll be nothing left because doubt will strip you bare. It will leave nothing. It will pick all the meat off the bones of your spiritual life. Indulging in doubt is like giving money to a thief. It will never, it was just feeding, feeding, feeding. Build up your faith. Amen? Stay in the Word of God. So what, let's go back to these parables. What do these parables have in common? The willingness of God is contrasted with the reluctance of the two chief characters. So here we have an unwilling friend, and then there we have an unwilling judge. But God is contrasted with them. He is our willing, loving Heavenly Father. And He is our perfectly able, willing, loving Heavenly Judge. Number two... You get your breakthrough at the throne of God. I want to say that for all of us who are in any kind of battle, any kind of persistence in prayer, I want to encourage you, stay on it. Don't give up. Stay with it. Stay the course. Don't quit. Your 
breakthrough is round the corner. Your breakthrough is coming. Hallelujah. Whether it's today or tomorrow or next week or next year. I've stood sometimes in my life for years, years and years to get a breakthrough. I prayed for my father for years, led him to the Lord at the age of 19 on his deathbed. Prayed for my mother for years, prayed for my family members for years. We've got to understand that prayer is a marathon, not a hundred meter sprint. Prayer is a way of life. Perseverance is a pattern of life. Um, Number three, faith-filled prayer is essential for breakthrough. Now, we got to understand that breakthrough comes not by whimpering at God, but by standing in faith. Jesus responds to faith, not need. Amen? Need alone doesn't get your breakthrough. Having a need in your life. We all have needs, but it's sons who come before the Heavenly Father and say, Father, I want to appropriate your promises. I want to receive of your goodness. I'm standing and claiming my breakthrough because that's what produces maturity, strength, and stature in the body of Christ. Finally, perseverance is the key to obtaining answered prayer. That's the message in both parables. That's the one message. It's perseverance. Persevere in prayer. It's so easy to give up, isn't it? Giving up takes a moment. Never giving up takes perseverance. Giving up comes from a sprint mentality. Well, I tried it, Lord. It didn't work. Well, I've asked you and you never answered. Perseverance is a marathon. Devotion to God in prayer is a lifetime posture. It's a default position we occupy. We, we are constantly living in and from the presence of God. And prayer is part of that. And perseverance, my friend, perseverance accepts the price. Perseverance accepts the cost. Perseverance accepts the pain. Perseverance accepts the suffering. If you can persevere in prayer... You can persevere in life. If you can hold on to God and not let go. There's an adversary that wants to rob you of what God has for you. And he's Satan. And Satan is contending against us just as the lady in that parable had an adversary and she came to that judge and she said vindicate me against my adversary now I'm not the kind of person that sees demons around every corner and behind every lamppost I'm not built that way but I want to say we must acknowledge that believers come under attack and it's foolish to put everything in life down to natural cause I've been so challenged and stirred about this recently um, Ursula and I have initiated an intercessors group and we have, you know, I was inspired by Graham. Graham and Becca have an intercessors group and I thought this is long enough. We, we've hit, you know, we, we, we go through challenging stuff and we've got a dedicated intercessors group and I am so excited and blessed about that. Um, we need to stand in prayer against the devices of the, of the enemy. We don't blame the devil for every problem in life, but neither do we deny his activity. And prayer protects you from every device of the devil. Prayer is the answer to dashed hopes, depression, 
delay and disappointment. And devotion in prayer brings promotion in life. Amen? Jesus said at the beginning of that parable in Luke 18, he said, it says this, Luke said this, now he told this parable so that people should pray and never give up. Can I tell you the answer to despair and disappointment and disillusionment and the answer to quitting is prayer. Prayer is the antidote to despair. Jesus said, if you want to be strong and not quit in life, the answer is prayer. He said, I'm giving you this parable to encourage you to pray and never give up. God wants to put a spirit in you and me today that says, I am never going to give up. I'm going to stand and keep on standing. I'm going to walk and keep walking. I'm going to fight and keep fighting. I'm going for this and nothing is going to put me off. You know, if you were sick with a disease and were given the antidote, you would take it and be healed. Prayer is like that. Prayer is the medicine of life. Prayer is the antidote for despair. The problem is believers won't take the medicine that Dr. Jesus is offering them. He writes out the prescription, pushes it across the desk, says, the answer's prayer. Oh, I don't like that. But you've got to take your medicine, guys. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to uh, finish right now, actually, and I want to do so by releasing a few things that I've seen uh, in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to have a time of ministry in a moment. And what I feel in my heart is this, that today is going to be a day where believers in this church make a, a fresh dedication to devotion. That I felt the Lord say we should not leave the devotion value without the dedication to devotion, without devoting ourselves to being devoted. And I believe there's something very significant because in the timing of this, because next week and, and the week after, we, we are into our Christmas family services and festivities and then holidays and then, you know, Boom, and we're in the new year, and we're moving on. But hear me now, there's, there's something very, very powerful I want to say right now. There's a moment right now for every one of us to carry the good of this year into the next year and not leave it. I, this is what I felt the Lord saying very strongly. There's a moment today where you can stuff in your bags everything that you've received this year and say, Lord, I'm taking that with me. There's a moment to quit or a moment for breakthrough. There's a, there's a decision to, de to take because I felt there were some people that were saying, well, it's been a tough year and I just want to forget about it. Or I haven't received what I wanted to receive and I'm going to drop those things. I, I felt it strongly in prayer last night that there were people here today who were being tempted at the close of this year to compromise on their stand for breakthrough. And I feel the Lord is saying to you, don't do it. Don't drop it. Pick it up. Carry it through the holidays. Carry it through the, year, through the end of this year and into next year because I am with you. I'm your loving Heavenly Father. I'm your just, righteous judge. And your breakthrough is is not a million miles away. It's round the corner. Don't quit. Your breakthrough's coming. Hallelujah. Now I want you to stand together and I'm, I'm going to re release what I, I saw. This is what I saw. I saw people carrying prayers to the edge of the new year and facing a choice. I see people carrying intercessions desires, dreams and visions, burdens of the heart 
and revelations from heaven, carrying, carrying, carrying through the year, believing and praying and standing and walking, but coming to this moment in time, this day, this service right now, coming with that and facing a choice. Will I drop my bag or will I carry on? And the Lord is saying, don't quit. Don't make the wrong choice this morning. And then I want to tell you what else I saw. I saw God in heaven holding out a scepter from the throne. A scepter of spiritual authority to wield in the earthly realm. A scepter of heaven for earthly use. A scepter of His spiritual authority. Because people have been fighting battles with the wrong weapons. You've been getting frustrated because you've been fighting earthly warfare with earthly weapons. But, the, but Paul says that he has given us spiritual weapons. And the, this is the point. The spiritual weapons are, are, are next level weapons to use, not, not just in prayer, but to, to apply in the earthly arena. And God is holding out a scepter to give you unfair advantage. How many of you would like an unfair advantage? Well, you've got it. You've got something the world doesn't have. You've got a loving Heavenly Father and a just, righteous judge that is interceding for you, standing for you, cheering for you, availing for you, offering all His promises and power to you. And He's holding out the scepter today and He's saying, will you stop getting angry and frustrated and in the flesh and getting carnal about this stuff. And will you instead reach up, take my royal scepter, take the authority, clothe yourself as a man and woman of God and stop acting like a carnal baby, bleating and, and whining and moaning about things. It's time to change them by holding out the scepter. Holding out the scepter in your home. Holding out the scepter in your office. Holding out the scepter in your factory. Holding out the scepter in your street. Bringing change, not through arguments, not through anger, but through your authority in and through the name of Jesus. I saw it. I saw it. I see a prayer revolution taking place in LifeSpring in 2020. And I believe that a prayer resolution is going to lead to a prayer revolution. And it's not that resolutions are wrong. Resolutions are good and right. And I believe the Lord is calling us today to make a prayer resolution that will lead to a prayer revolution. And He's offering the opportunity to revolutionize our prayer for you as a person, for you in family, and for you in church. It's happening it was there this morning in our prayer room. New people coming in. Different people. Prayer room was full this morning. And, and I believe it's going to be happening in 2020. There'll be so many people in that prayer room. There won't be room enough in there. We'll have to find somewhere else to pray. We'll have to move out into the star room or somewhere else. Because people are persevering in prayer. You'll persevere when you know the power of prayer. When you're convinced of the power and the authority that you have in prayer, that's what will make you pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I see people rising up in bold, persevering prayer. I hear the sound of a prayer storm. I see people carrying devoted hearts into this Christmas season. Hold Him in devotion through this time. Don't abandon prayer in the Christmas season. He is the reason for the season. I felt the Lord say, when you sit down to eat, give thanks to Him. On Christmas Day, when you gather as families, with your children, with your families, with your relatives, with your friends, don't worry if they're Christian or non-Christian. They've come into your house. It's time to stand for what you believe and say, this is our Christmas celebration. We're going to pray. We're going to give thanks. Stop being intimidated by the unbelievers and actually realize that the world is looking for people who, who are, who've got something worth standing up for and speaking out for. Celebrate Jesus this Christmas. Cleave to Him in prayer and the Word of God. Speak of Him. Worship Him. This morning, we're going to devote ourselves to Christ. Hallelujah. If you know this is the time to, to, to get 
to get off the middle ground, to get off the fence and, and, and make a, a commitment to devotion, I want you to come down even now. Come down the front right now. If you know, that's me, Lord. It's time to make that commitment. It's time to be devoted. It's time to come off the fence. Hallelujah. Come down the front. Don't delay. Thank you, Steve. We can just worship. We're going to have a time of worship now. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old